Well, thank you for taking the time to talk oh. with us. Oh, it's an honor to talk always about peace. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, my dear sister, um, one of the things that we've always had to deal with finally as artists is the whole idea of peace. Mm -hmm. So when you ask the question, you know, at what time did I begin to involve myself with peace? In the midst of the fiery 60s, you know, when we engage everybody, you know, the world, um, always at the, at the base of the skull, you know, at the tip of the tongue was always the idea of the possibility of peace in the, in the midst of the uproar. So, you know, in the 70s, um, I was very, I have been always involved with WILF. I'm, I'm a, you know, um, a charter member of WILF. Mm -hmm. um, I wrote for their magazine. Mm -hmm. I interviewed people and interviewed books, um, of Winnie Mandela's books, you know, there always had something to say for one whole year. I went on the road for Wilf around the country, engaging uh, people uh, with the idea of not only peace, but, but enjoying uh, Wilf. And I targeted a lot of people of color who saw it always as a white organization. And so I targeted them to say, you know, for this idea of peace and justice in this country, we've got to really all be in many organizations. Because people would question me, why are you doing this for Wilf, you know? And I said, because I believe in Women's International League for Peace, you know, and freedom, that uh, peace and freedom and justice really go together. And so that's what I did. And of course, you know, we always had marches for peace. Um, whenever there was a march for peace, I always managed to go. I didn't always speak uh, there, but the idea I would uh, uh, schlep my, you know, you know, my kids along um, uh, to walk uh, for this idea of peace in New York City. Um, and afterwards, we would have always a an evening of of a culture they called it, and so there would be uh, Ruby Dee and Ozzie Davis and I would uh, do something up at Riverside Church, um, uh, you know, about this whole idea of peace, you know, entertainment in the evening. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, it's always been there. Uh, you know, as an African-American, always at the base of my skull, in the midst of uproar has been the whole idea that we've got to engage a country in the world of, with peace. Uh, when you're very young, Sometimes um, you don't always combine your effort with change, with peace. You know, it's interesting that, you know, we were very noisy about change and um, about America and about discrimination. And it wasn't um, uh, the peace work. And at some point, you know, many of us moved into doing work about peace. But then we also understood that the combination that one had to combine them both. They were not separate. Just as what I try to tell people, the culture is not separate from the work that we do. You know, quite often, you know, in the movement, there would be people having conversations and then they said, then we're going to have a cultural night, you know. So they remove the, um, the activism of the cultural workers, you know, from the activism of discussing or or making policy. So I, my voice was always a very loud voice about the not separating the two, mm -hmm. that there was no real separation there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Was it the, the big <coughs> nuclear disarmament march in 82? Yeah, that, that was it. My yeah. mother was very pregnant with me at that march. She still talks about it. <laughs> oh, that was a major march, oh, <coughs> an amazing march, right. Yeah. Um, can you talk more about how um, haiku is an art form and, and nonviolence are related for you? You've been right. writing haikus for for a long time. A long, long time. It's an amazing form, you know. The haiku has no aggression. It has no war. Uh, it has no, I mean, I mean, there's nothing, and I always say there's no fat attached to it. It's lean, you know, it's lean and mean, as someone said, uh, one of the kids said, but I said, no, it's not mean, but it's, it's, it's lean, you know. It's, um, 
there's no meanness attached to it. You know, it's uh, a very, as one of the children said, a very cool form, uh, and it is. But what it does is that it captures that moment, you know, that e e emotion, you know, and it quite often ties up, does it not, um, uh, uh, nature and self. The nature of self, you know, and in a sense the nature of nature, and we find out just how closely aligned they all are. Um, so if I can teach a child and, and a college student and a grad student um, um, the beauty of nature, you know, and then also the beauty of the nature of self, um, you know, uh, I, I've begun to, to, in a sense, in, get them intrigued with the idea of, of the beauty of peace. Um, um, uh, this haku that at some point is what I use every morning I get up, I write a haku. Uh, my last book was called Morning Haku, but because I had so many haku floating around, and when they asked me for a book, I said, yes, I'll, I'll do Morning Haku. But, you know, I had all these haku that I've been doing every morning. But what it does is a discipline. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it prepares me for the day just as my walk, my three miles every morning prepare me for the day also, too, as I walk. Um, this haku is my form of meditation. Uh, that it, it, it grounds me um, and it makes me truly understand that as I go out each day, I must take um, the idea of the haku with me, uh, the, haku, uh, the idea that the haku is a, is a, is a, is a peace is a haku song. This haku is really about peace. And so when I teach children the haku, I don't go in and teach the form. I immediately teach them how to breathe. Uh, and in teaching them the breath coming from here and teaching them when they breathe in, it, the, the stomach distends, they are utterly amazed at that. Because, of course, you know, when I tell them they observe little babies, that's what happens with babies. But they, their breath has not been, um, uh, in a sense, um, what word do I want to use? Compromise. Mm -hmm. You know, we get older. You know, like when we're young, children are so truthful. They tell the truth or whatever. When children are little, they also breathe. Uh, the breath is not compromised. But we get older and people begin to tell us things and, 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 and we go out in a way and things stun us. And so the breath becomes compromised. So we breathe from here and from here and from here and from here. When I teach them to, uh, to breathe from here, they are amazed. They cough sometimes, you know, and then I make them. But I'm teaching them how to live because breath is life, I tell them. If you don't breathe properly, you're not going to probably maybe, you know, live for a very long time. So they're amazed by the breath coming from here. And we do that, and I let them count to a certain amount of time. But it also calms the class, you know. Uh, you know, we give our children pills to calm them down. If we teach them how to breathe, that calms them down too. It's a natural way of controlling that activity. And then I teach them also how to listen to each other's heartbeat. I make them pair up, you know, they face each other. And then I, um, I give, um, I take my right hand and I place my right hand on my partner's heart and that my partner would place her or his right hand on my heart. Now, sometimes I pair up with a young male who begins to put his hand up by the heart, but there's the breast there. So you have to say, oh, it's only a breast. You know, you know, my children, you know, I fed my children with this breast. It's not porno. And they fall out laughing on the floor, you know. So again, you get them very, you know, uh, easy. And it's easy. He can put the hand there. But I'm, I put my hand on on his heart, he puts his hand on my heart, then I cover his hand, right? Okay? And he covers my hand on his heart. And then I say, okay, by this time the class, they're doing it, but they're noisy. So I say, Whoosh, everyone keep quiet. Now let's listen to each other's heartbeat. An amazing thing happens in that class when it becomes quiet. They hear a human heartbeat, which means they hear a human being, which means they, their eyes go up from the hands to the eyes and they make contact and they see a human being, not a schoolmate, you know, not someone to get mad at, not someone to scream at, not someone to hustle, not someone to, you know, beat up a human being. And the moment you can make that human contact in the classroom, you got a class, you know, then and only then do you teach the haku. 
with its beauty and its peace, whatever. And it flows from the fingertips then, you know, because at that point, you know, we realize that this, um, this haku is shared vision in that classroom. You know, um, um, it means also, too, that at some point when I talk about, you know, peace for them and they do a haku on their own, it's not peace. And then I help help them to do a peace haku sometimes by, you know, have, writing the first line, right? They move at a different level, but it's a, I can feel the peace in the class. I mean, it's a different class, you know, from when I walked in to this new class and it was like, you know, up here someplace. And, and, and I guess all I'm saying that the one haku, the two haku that happened, you know, in that classroom, uh, it's an amazing moment. Um, and they know, they can feel something's happening there. And they say things like, well, you're coming back. We're going to continue this. And I said, well, yeah, I'll be back. You know, we'll continue this. But it is indeed that moment that you begin to understand the importance of not only the haku, but the importance of peace, you know, uh, for our children, uh, the importance of the breath for our children, the importance of eating properly for our children also too. Um, when I do free association exercises with them, I bring in um, a rice cracker and they just crack up like, what's this thing, right, ever? I've never tasted it, but they write from what it tastes like, and so you pass it out, but it's a, a rice cracker, you know, uh, it has seaweed in it. Um, you know, they taste it, and they want to not like it, but eventually they, they do, they keep chewing and ask for another one. One, they're hungry, you know, for one thing, so you can get them to eat it, right? But what I'm saying simply is that you then, you know, in a sense, invade everything that has to do with f the, what they eat, you know, mm -hmm. uh, also what they think, you know, uh, how then I tell them every morning they wake up before they move, they must write a haku mm -hmm. in the morning. You know, it will help them begin to move in, in the house. They must keep a journal a haku journal also too. And I show them mine, you know, and I read them what I do and every morning. So at the end of 30, 31 days, they have this book of haku. Mm -hmm. And I said, and in just the writing of it, you know, you would begin to breathe in a different fashion as you write. Uh, so yeah. This peace mural that, that we've done here in the city of Philadelphia, um, I called Toni Morrison and Maya Angelou and Alice Walker and I said, you know, as a poet laureate, I'm, I'm doing, the first thing I'm doing, major thing I'm doing, besides the readings that I do and the workshops that I do, I want to do a peace mural in the city of Philadelphia. You know, we've got to insinuate peace in our children's eyes and in their hands and in their feet, whatever. And this is one way, a place they can come to, you know, and look at. And they said, whoa, right away, yes. I mean, it was no like, well, I don't know, Sonia. I don't have, to. I mean, they just like one, two, three, within a week, I had everything that I needed. And then I, uh, Carmen invited me to um, uh, 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 something he was doing in Chicago, um, uh, on a red carpet of, of a film that he was doing. And so I asked him for a peace haku, and he did it. So, you know, Carmen is up on that wall. Um, of course, Martin Luther King is on that wall. Uh, Professor John Brace, the historian, is on that wall. Um, you know, all these people are, are on that wall, um, you know, looking at us, all of us, and saying simply that, uh, children can come, there would be benches that they can sit on, and the children's haku would be inscribed on the benches also too. So you, every place you sit, uh, there should be six benches leading down to the, um, the mural, um, and they have to inscribe when it gets warmer, um, the peace haku that the children have written, so it would be a pathway to freedom. When you're not feeling, mm -hmm. you know, quite yourself, you know, you know where this came from? Before Columbine happened, I was in a place called, I forget, I, forget, it was, I was in Mid Midwest. I, I was on a book tour. I started a book tour up at uh, Sarah Lawrence, went to Atlanta, and went to the Midwest, heading all the way for California. You know what? Book tours are very tiring. So I got to this place in the Mid Midwest, and I said, well, good. When I finish, I can sleep late. I go to California, I pick up an, another hour, and I, can, I don't have anything to do until the next day. So I'm thinking about resting the next day. But after 
I had signed books, and the, uh, and close to adults left. There were these young people, high school students, twelve strong, standing. And they walk over to me and say, "Can you come and do an assembly for us uh, tomorrow morning, Professor mm -hmm. Sanchez?" And I'm thinking, "What time?" <laughs> they said, "Eight o'clock." I said. Oh, well, I, I'm thinking, oh, no, you're, you were going to sleep to 10, 11 o'clock. You know, you were so tired. But I, then I said, what's the deal? And the deal was that they were being teased, some of them, for being gay. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, but you are responsible for getting me to the airport. And at that time, you know, you, you know it wasn't, it was before 9-11 happened, right? Mm -hmm. And so... Um, I said, you, you're responsible. It said, sure, we'll pick you up at 7.15. So I get up to my hotel room thinking, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. But anyway, they come. And I get in this car that looks like it's held together with rubber bands, you know. And I'm sitting there like this, trying to hold a conversation, trying to say, whoa. But anyway, they put my luggage, you know, in, in the back. And, you know, and you were hoping that the trunk would hold everything, whatever. And we go, the genius for me of young people, you know, my dear sister Angelita, the genius is that. They already probably had said I was going to come, so they had it already planned, but they put it together. And at 8 o'clock, I get on stage, and there they all are you know, in assembly. That's the genius of young people, the genius of teenagers. They can organize things like, psh, you know, that's why I love them always involved with the idea of peace, right? Um, and there we were, and I, and, I, and I came out and read, and read a couple of real, in quotes, hip poems, you know, mm -hmm. that could gather them in. And then I started talking about the whole idea of respect, you know, how we must re respect differences and blah, 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 blah. And I was hard. And then after you, you know, you know after you, you were hard, then you were soft. You know, you had that balance there. And, and I thanked them for letting me come. And then I got ready to get off the stage, and I turned around, I said, you know, it was one of those old schools with three floors. You know, I used to build those schools with mm -hmm. three floors. Um, I said, on every floor you should have at the end of each, uh, um, at the end of each ha the hallway, a table and a chair and a bell. And some kind of picture or maybe some books, right? When you feel as if you are going to really hurt somebody, go sit there and ring a bell. And have so someone can come and talk to you, take you to a room and talk you to, you know, talk it, talk you out of it and talk about it. Or if you think you're going to be, you know, someone's going to beat you up <laughs> when you leave out of here, you know, in the in, in the afternoon, you come and ring that bell and talk to someone, uh, your counselor or teacher about your fears. What I was saying simply was that, you know, we need a table of peace in these schools on every floor. And that's what, that was the, the concept that I brought, you know, the benches of peace, you know, leading up to the peace mural. That the peace mural was not an end in itself. Yes, read, read a Nobel Prize laureate's words on peace, right? You know, and a Pulitzer Prize woman's words on peace, right? Uh, read Martin Luther King's words on peace also, too. Um, a historian also's word. Um, uh, uh, one of the men who founded a church in Philadelphia. Read all these words and then sit down and ab absorb them, you know. Or when you feel unpeaceful, go to that peace mural, you know. And um, that was the whole point you know, of it, as far as I was concerned, not to make that an end uh, of, of itself, but, but to make the city then surround and be a part of the peace mural with, with the benches, you know, the peace benches, um, uh, the peace path, you know, to uh, there. And, you know, and certainly I think the pe we should have a peace path, you know, to the museum also, too, mm -hmm. you know, uh, to, to talk to the mural arts about that also, too, mm -hmm. because we really need to make sure that we are co-joined, you know, at the spine, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I live in this community on purpose. You know, when I moved here um, from Amherst, they um, took me to two places, right around Penn and Chestnut Hill. And I and they said to me in Chestnut Hill, the, 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 the person, the realtor said, you're going to integrate Chestnut Hill. I said, I did that in New York. I integrated Riverside Drive and the village with a whole lot of other people. I said, uh, I want a place where there are people who look like me, who don't look like me, who are young, who are old. 
I want a place where their workers, you know, and their professors, you know, um, their bus drivers. Uh, uh, I want a place where we can kind of look at each other. I can sit on my porch and see children walking to school. As I as happened not this past summer, the summer before last, um, and they stopped in front of my house and they were arguing. And I'm sitting there. I've walked already. I'm drinking my tea. I'm writing, and I really, you know, but I'm writing. I love the porch, as opposed to the backyard, right? And finally, I got up and went off the steps and said, Hey, 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 what, what's going on here? She said, she said, no, no, no. I said, come on, come on, come on, come with me, come with me. And I said, what do you mean? I said, come with me up the steps. I said, you see this? What do you see here? They said, well, we see a table, we see books and a newspaper and a pot of tea. I said, yeah. I said, come in my house. I said, now, what do you feel in here? They looked around. They said, oh, it's quiet. I said, mm, what else? What's another word for quiet? It's peaceful. Yeah. It's, I said, but my porch is peaceful too. And I said, and I want you to know that that sidewalk out there is mine. It should be peaceful too. I don't want no, if you feel like you're going to argue, ring my bell in the morning and I can talk to you about, you know. So I tried to have someone uh, paint um, uh, Peace Is in front of mine on the sidewalk there, but they moved, they got a job and moved to. Um, uh, first person arts, they were going to do it. I'm going to see if I can get someone from Mirror Arts to do it. And to put on the trees, the evergreen trees, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, things that say peace, peace is. Because they stop, they, when they go by and I'm out there, they stop and do this, whatever. But they're not arguing. You know, we, have, we do have to insinuate ourselves, you know, in a very real way. And as I started off this piece, um, uh, into our children's hands and eyes and hearts. We've got to be peaceful with them. We've got to hug peace back into them. We've got to make them understand that this city does love them. Most, most uh, students would tell me, this city doesn't care anything about me. This teachers don't care anything about me. And I, so I, I was in a class, oh yes, I, I, when I, I started to say, yes, they do. And then I leaned back and said, you're right, you're probably not. And then they, then they listen. See, if I jumped and said, yes, they do, then, I, then they would have just ignored me. But I said, you know, you're probably right, because I went to school in New York City. The teachers cared very little about us, and the city could care less. I mean, the, the, they had no garbage pickup, you know. All these things that happened in our neighborhood, you know, we had no protection, whatever. You're right. If the city had cared, they would have picked up the garbage, you know, blah, blah, blah. So they're telling me about a city that they have already looked at. And so at some point we have to figure out how does the city care? You know, how would the city bring in this whole idea of peace? So one of the things besides just having a peace week, you know, we've got to have a uh, I want to take the, 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 uh, the junior poet laureates into the schools so we can have peace sites in these schools. You know what I mean? So we should have a peace site. Your museum is a peace site. The mirror is a peace site. You know, when they do these little maps, we want to have on the maps of, of Philadelphia a peace site. So we want peace sites to be around. Uh, the benches are peace sites. You know, the walkway to peace, peace site. Where else? We want to say to the students, let's make your school a peace site. Mm -hmm. Okay? Envision Peace Museum must have a vision for people young and old. And one of the things that, you know, there are some major quilters around this country, around this city. They'd be great to begin to invite them in to hold their quilting sessions there mm -hmm. so they can do a peace quilt there. I mean, a major peace quilt, you know, for the new one that's going to happen. Uh, uh, I, I, we have now a junior poet laureate, right, and a runner-up. And as I'm, I'm, I'm you know, putting them together uh, to travel with me here, and they can be part of uh, in, inviting uh, young people in to do workshops, you know, mm -hmm. to do peace haku, you know, mm -hmm. uh, so therefore they can do peace journals, you know, uh, you know, uh, every month a peace journal, but they will be coming into there. There should be um, the activism in that museum, mm -hmm. um, not a place, as most museums, you come and you look, you look, you look, and then you go, you know, but 
uh, a museum where, uh, you know, peace is a verb, you know, peace is action, because you see all the people sitting down, learning how to write, um, uh, learning how to go out and speak the peace that they know in their schools also, too. Um, as I said, the peace quilt also, too. Uh, you know, people coming in uh, for lectures um, uh, to, make, to make us understand what I call uh, the intellect of peace. Mm -hmm. You know, people get very emotional about peace. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But I want people to have this intellect of peace. And I don't mean that, I don't, by that I don't mean the book learning thing, but like peace really does have a, a separate intellect. You know, so one of the things I tried to do in the 80s was to start peace studies at Temple. Mm -hmm. There's very, there's a lot of quiet about that. I mean, I went to high places and they said they couldn't afford it. Mm -hmm. And because I had been in, um, was it Kansas? Forget now. There's a peace institute at one of, I spoke, mm -hmm. I, I did the, one of the major lectures at the peace institute in the Midwest someplace, you know, and uh, I was so impressed with what they were doing. I brought back all of it. I brought it back to Temple, and I said I want to begin a peace institute uh, here. And the, at the time that we were doing it, trying to do it, they said we have no money to do it. Um, so one of the things I think that the Peace Museum should have a peace institute, you know, where we start courses. Mm -hmm. Because I tried to start, what I tried to start there was peace studies. I was in women's studies, mm -hmm. so I tried to start peace studies. We need peace studies. Mm -hmm. So we need to uh, pull professors from UPenn and Temple and all over the country, right, to come in and do a series of lectures called peace, you know, uh, studies as such. And that would be a great contribution to the city to have the peace studies there, um, coming out of that building, coming out of that museum. Um, so we began the discussion of peace in a very, very important fashion, important way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think peace is a verb, you know, it's a subject, um, um, it's a noun. Um, peace is not an easy thing to envision. As I was surprised, you, the, the museum, I was happy and surprised, envision peace. Because if you really ask people to envision peace, they come up with just words. Mm -hmm. You know, a word here, you know. Uh, whatever, a garden, you know, all kinds of interesting things. But you really cannot envision peace unless you've made peace with yourself, you know, your family, your house. You know, when, when, when I come in here, I take off my shoes usually, and then I stand out and brush off what I've gathered <laughs> during the day. Because we gather during the day very unpeaceful you know, non-mindful things, whatever, et cetera. And so you leave it out, you don't bring it into the house. But we must really make people become very mindful uh, that when they are saying the word peace, that simply, that it, it has got to penetrate every, every, every part of our body, you know, it's got to move into the bloodstream. So it's almost like sometimes you get up in the morning and you chant peace, you know? In different ways, peace, 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 peace. You have to sing peace, you know. We have to sing peace. We have to make peace become part of our hum. Peace. And and when I do that in the morning, I bring I I'm mindful that I am starting a day, you know, with peace accompanying me during the day. Um, the point is, at some point we've got to not sit and just talk about peace, but we've got to make peace a part of our every moment. Um, we've got to, in a sense, um, um, bring peace behind our eye sockets, you know, put it at the base of, of um, our brain, right? We've got to say peace in so many different languages um, and in so many different ways. Because if we don't do that, then we, we're just walking around 
the city sometimes, and then we get to a meeting and say, oh, now we're going to talk about peace. And that becomes difficult if you have not, in a sense, uh, brought peace into your psyche, brought peace into your bloodstream, um, uh, brought peace into the way you eat. Mm -hmm. You know, um, uh, I believe that we've got to be mindful about peace. You know, Thich Nhat talks about being mindful all the time. But when you get up in the morning, the reason why I write the peace haku immediately is because it makes me become mindful about peace. You know, and it's not an adjunct or it's not a meeting or it's not a poem or it's not an, uh, um, an idea, you know, but it's a way of life. Mm -hmm. That's difficult to always explain. The people who get that the easiest are children. Adults have too many things blocking it, you know, like war, you know, like greed, mm -hmm. you know. Like, I got to go to work now, I got to drive my car, uh, I can't hum, you know. But the point is that, you know, humming is a vibration, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and, you know, if you hum, if you whistle peace or hum peace, it really does calm the body a great deal. That, that's just the whole mechanism of humming or singing. But humming is amazing. I never understood why my grandmother used to hum all the time. I walk and she would, mm, and I was, oh gosh, she's humming again. Um, but at some point, I really listened to humming, and the humming would go from humming to song and humming again. But what made me so peaceful, I stretch out, was that vibrational thing that happened when she hummed. The same with the whistling, you know, that is, is a vibration that it makes for all kinds of peaceful things happening all the way from your head to your stomach. And humming does the same kind of thing. Um, I don't know um, if this is going to be uh, something that we teach uh, at some particular point, but I do know I do, when I teach a workshop of writing, I make my students, students do a week of mindfulness, you know, um, um, and just one day of not saying anything negative about anyone. I start with one day because they say they can't do a week. So one day, uh, and, and they said, what do you mean? I said, do not twist and curl your tongue and say anything negative about anyone. And they look at me and say, well, the, young, the, the younger ones say, well, you can do that because you're older. I said, no, people my age talk about everybody. But can you imagine that if we can get a city not to say anything negative about anyone for one day, a city, mm -hmm. a city, just a city, whatever, that people watch their tongues, then I guarantee you that we'll cut down on crime, on, on, on people killing each other. Because I tell them, if you say something negative about someone, then you will hit someone. If you hit someone, you will kill someone, you know. Um, and it is hard to do. As if, you, if you find yourself before the day is over saying something negative, just stop. Wait a couple of days and then start again. But it's that conscious, conscious effort of say, not saying anything negative about anyone that begins to make your tongue become peaceful. Because our tongues are unpeaceful. You know, we curse people. Like, you know, every time you watch the idiot box, that is the television, you know, there's someone says, Joe Schmo killed someone because they were arguing. Now, I teach the, the students, what do I teach them? I say, if someone says something negative to you, just say, I am so sorry, I didn't mean to offend you. Can you tell me what it is I did to offend you? I come from New York City, and my, our early poetry, we came, come out of the black arts movement, we sliced people in two with our tongues. You know, we took no prisoners, and we thought like, whoa, because you come from New York. You know, you have the quick tongue, the fast tongue, the, 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 the fast response, repartee. You say something and you see someone just fall out because you have sliced them in two, whatever, with a tongue. But it didn't change anything. The person thought the same thought that he or she thought at the beginning. And I say to my students, when you say that, then you make the person come to your level where you are. You don't go to his or her level, and that is like you curse them out too, and there you are fighting each other and hurting each other. 
you know. And it is, I, it is this inner peace that we talk about, translated into an outer peace. It is indeed this inner peace that we know that we must have in order to teach peace. You cannot teach peace if there's no inner peace. You know, it becomes like the mouth, whatever, you know. And you leave out, get in a car, you drive, and you curse another driver when you're driving home. I've been to meetings with people like that. And they've like, so well, what do they mean trying to get in front of me? And you say very gently, we're only going to save one minute. That's it. Do you understand what I'm saying? So we must be mindful of this whole idea of peace and mindful that activism is peaceful activism, you know, that we learn, you know. So when we grandmothers went into, um, we, when, we, when we went into, what is that? Uh, we went into, where, where, they, where, they, uh, where they, they, you sign up uh, for a war. Office? Huh? A recruit, like a recruitment office? To the recruitment yeah. center, right, uh, a couple of years ago all over the country, <clears throat> the Grandmothers for Peace went into recruitment centers. And we went in and sat in. And the guy came out and at first he was like saying, very nice, said, oh yes, okay, you can do this, you can do that, you can do that. And then we began to talk to the young people who were coming in to sign up. And we said simply, I went to speak to a young man, young African-American man, I said, you know, why are you signing up for, you know, to fight? He said, because they told me that I could, would become a doctor if I did. I said, well, I'm not too sure that's going to happen. However, if you want to meet some doctors, I can take you to Temple, uh, you know, med school, UPenn med school, Columbia, and you can meet some doctors. They can tell you what you need to do to become a doctor. But I can guarantee if you sign up here for Army, you'll never, ever, ever become a doctor. Okay? Mm -hmm. And so they left. But it was then that the recruitment you know, a uh, person said, you all must leave. And we said, no, we don't want to leave. We really do want to stay and talk to you about peace. And, and he began to talk about how he had, interesting, how he had come from the South and he had gotten ad many advantages from, you know, joining up, you know. And, you know, he was able to pull himself and his family up out of poverty, mm -hmm. you know. And we listened very, you know, very carefully, but we still sat in saying we wanted to talk to other people about peace and they called the police. Police came and they sent the regular detective who does this. There's one guy, same detective every time who comes in, you know, and he says, okay, ladies, I'm going to have to get the handcuffs for you. And we said, please don't, you don't have to because we're not trying to run away. <laughs> we're trying to stay. And so he went away and came back again. He said, okay, we won't handcuff you with your back. We'll do it in front. And we said, well, no, don't do that. We have, a, we have our dear sister here in the wheelchair. He went away and he came back. He sent back a, a female police officer. And this police officer came up and said, oh, Professor Sanchez, what are you doing here? Why are you getting arrested? And a former student, you teach 40 years, you have students every place on the planet Earth. And I said, I whispered to her because I didn't want to get in trouble. I said, my dear sister, we're sitting in because, um, you know, we're trying to close down these recruitment centers. We're trying to get people um, from joining, uh, you know, here. And she said, but don't you worry, Professor Sanchez. You are my professor. I will take good care of you. And then I said very calmly to her, my dear sister, if you take good care of me, you have to take care, good care of these other 12 sisters here, right? And they did. But as we were being, you know, taken out to the paddy wagon, um, a woman from NPR called out, Professor Sanchez, what would you have done if you had gone to boot camp? I said, we would have done push-ups for peace. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm really leading to, that every morning we get up, we must do push-ups for peace. Before we go to work, we must do push-ups for peace. But even at work, we must do push-ups for peace because people at work will engage you in conversations that will make you want to slap, slap, curse, curse, get angry, angry. It's very difficult to maintain this sense of peace in the midst of this kind of deranged <laughs> living sometimes, deranged uh, cities, but it's a good practice for us to make ourselves practice peace wherever we go, mm -hmm. you know, in the city, at work, at school, 
right? Mm -hmm. Wherever we go. Um, and to make every place we go what I call a holy place, uh, which is, and I'm not talking religiously, but a holy place. Mm -hmm. That it won't happen in a year. You know, you'll probably have to go up, go into peace, right? Mm -hmm. Peace is a life. Peace and justice, uh, they're lifetime things that we must do. Um, you know, we thought initially in the 60s that it would come immediately, actually. We thought it would come in at least 10 years, right? Mm -hmm. And it didn't. Then we thought it would come in 20 years, and it didn't. Some people gave up, you know, mm -hmm. and went off as, I was someplace giving a speech, and, and someone, unimportant who she is, came up and said, Ah, Sonia, I see you're still talking about this peace and this justice and change, right? I said, yes, you know, it's a lifetime's work. She says, well, I stopped because I'm making lots of money now. And I thought, well, that's good because then you can contribute to, to, <laughs> to the movement. <laughs> But she walked away. <laughs> but, but to young people, I would say that you've got to do it because this is your century. This is the 21st century. I've been given some time in, in the 21st century, and I'm, I'm blessed, and I'm happy. The 20th century uh, was basically many of our, our, our centuries, you know. Uh, what we attempted to do at that, in, that, in the 20th century was begin to answer the question, what does it mean to be human? Mm -hmm. And if you become a peace worker, you would then begin to truly answer the question, what does it mean to be human as peace workers? Um, and you've got to understand that as young people, I would be pissed at my elders uh, for the kind of world that we're handing, uh, uh, handing to them. And so it's incumbent upon them always to become peace workers, but also activists. Peace work doesn't mean just meeting whatever. That I said, when you're on a campus, you've got to involve yourself with activism, with various organizations, not just your little organization. You can't say, I belong to a peace movement and then don't engage yourself with, with, with racial work, you know, with economic work, you know, with, um, with gay and lesbian work. I mean, all that has got to happen, transgendered work, you know. You cannot just sit in your little office and hand out little pamphlets and say, we're for peace. You're not for peace um, if you don't do all of that work, you see. And that's what I would say to young people. It's a long, long, long walk towards, uh, towards peace and towards freedom and towards justice, but it's a glorious walk. Mm -hmm. It's the only walk. It, that, it is the only walk that has kept me sane. Uh, on this earth. Uh, it's on a work, uh, walk that I've wanted to walk. Um, and it's a walk also that is covered with, 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 with great people. As you walk this walk, you, you will meet a lot of great people who've walked this walk also too. And they will say to you, thank you, welcome, welcome to this path of freedom, this path of justice, this path of peace, uh, this path that says simply, welcome, we need you. For this earth, you know, um, this earth will not be a just earth until you young people pick up um, uh, the mantle of peace and justice and freedom. Yeah. Well, I think that we've got to insist that those automatic weapons are no longer available to any citizen, you know? Um, you know, the weapons that they, they, keep, they keep saying, we must have our Second Amendment rights. Yeah, but those, amend those, those things that happened in the past, you know, during the revolutionary days were about people, you know, since we didn't have a standing army, right? about people defending the country. That's what that was about. It wasn't about your right to have a gun because you think you have that right. It was for protection of a country that was moving towards freedom at that time. And, we, and there was no standing army to protect. We have a standing army now. Um, and there's, I, don't, and so I know there are people who like to hunt. You know, people have rifles. I know that I travel a lot, so I know there are people who have rifles. They go out hunting, etc. I'm merely saying out loud that at some point, 
if we are to protect our children uh, in this country, we've got to say to people simply that there is no necessity for you to have something that goes uh, and shoots. How many rounds? I don't know how many rounds, but too many rounds. Um, that comes a great deal from this whole idea that we have a right to have automatic weapons in our houses. And there's no place in the Constitution that says that at all. Um, but what I do think we must begin to talk about uh, is that how then do we resolve problems in a city? Um, we don't resolve problems through violence or just to, with the police. You know, we don't resolve problems by stop and frisk. You know, there are laws now that, that have been um, passed at some point um, that, you know, people are giving up their real freedoms, you know, in order to have, in quotes, peace, as they say. We have young people who told me that they know where to get guns on the streets of Philadelphia, if you want one. Um, and they don't know how to get good schooling on the streets of Philadelphia, you know, mm -hmm. uh, good food. In, on the streets, from these stores in, in the streets of Philadelphia, but they know where to get a good gun. They've sold the idea that every household should have a gun, you know. Now let's sell the, the idea that every household should have peace, you know. It can be done. I mean, we have people, add people, who could sell peace for us with one year. I always say from sages, though, how do we make peace profitable? See, war is profitable. Selling guns is profitable. How do you make peace profitable? And I say to all the economic majors, I have an assignment for you. You've got to make peace profitable, finally. How do we make it profitable? What can we give young people, right, who want guns? You know, what can we give them um, that will make them want to be peaceful? You know, that's a problem. And it's a problem we should try to figure out.